everyone, me again. So today, I'm not really looking forward to today's topic because it's got loads of different details and I'm really worried about forgetting something which will make editing really tricky. But I have uh, some crib notes, so even teachers need crib notes because we can't remember everything, so hopefully that will help me get through this video. Today's topic is structures and this is a chemistry topic, so we're talking about ionic lattices, covalent structures, and I'm going to tell you all about those and all the properties that they have. First of all, it's important to know that all structures can be divided into two groups, either molecules or giant structures. And the crucial difference between these is that molecules are made up of a fixed, and that's crucial, a fixed number of atoms. And that can range from as little as two to many thousand. But the point is that it's fixed. Now, inside the molecule, the atoms are joined together by covalent bonds. Remember, these are very, very strong bonds. But that these bonds are only found inside the molecule. Giant structures differ greatly in that they have a variable number of atoms, so these are unfixed, and that means that you can have molecules which are absolutely enormous, made up of tens of thousands of atoms. So that's the main difference there. I'm going to start by talking about giant structures and take each structure in turn, starting with metallic lattices. Now remember, in metals, the structure is that they have positive metal ions, and remember they're in a really regular arrangement, and they're surrounded by a sea of delocalised electrons, which just means that these electrons are free to move. The metals tend to be very strong and have high melting and boiling points, and that's because the attraction between the positive metal ion and the negative electrons are very, very strong, so they're difficult to break. And that's the answer you need to provide in the exam. So with all of these points I'm making and all the properties I give, you kind of need to learn them as an answer because they're quite specific and it will definitely help with your exam exams if you can answer them in a very precise way. So remember that metals conduct electricity and that's because of these electrons which are free to move. So you would write there are delocalised electrons which can carry the electric current. Metals are malleable and ductile. Now, what do those mean? Remember, malleable means that you can hammer the metal into shape, and ductile means you can draw them out into a long string. This is because the metal ions can slide over each other. We can make metals slightly stronger by alloying, and remember, that's just mixing one metal with another metal. So, in the case of brass, this is an alloy, it's not an element. That's made up of a combination of copper and zinc. And the reason why this is slightly stronger is because the copper and zinc atoms are slightly different sizes and therefore they don't slide over each other as well. Let's just check I've got all the points I wanted to mention. And the last thing obviously is that they conduct heat, which means that the heat applied to one end causes the ions to vibrate and they pass that energy on to neighbouring ions. So the next structure we need to talk about is giant ionic structures. And the crucial thing about giant ionic and that these are massive, and we sometimes call them lattices if we're being really technical. An ionic lattice is made up of oppositely charged ions. So in the case of sodium chloride, and we have a picture of this, which for some examples you will need to be able to draw this, you have positive metal ions, which are the sodium ions, with a one plus charge, and you have negative chlorine ions, and they're one minus charge. Remember that an ion is a charged particle, that means it's either gained or lost charge, so it's either positive or negative. So you'll see a very regular arrangement and you'll find that these structures, these ionic lattices, have very high melting points and boiling points and they're very strong and that's because of the strong forces of attraction between oppositely charged ions. If you take another example, such as magnesium chloride, remember the formula of this is MgCl2. If you're struggling with that, check out my video on writing common formulae because that will help you understand. But in this case, you have stronger bonds because you have the attraction between Magnesium, which has a 2 plus charge, and the 2 minus that comes from the two lots of chlorine ions that form the bond. So it's going to be stronger than sodium chloride. Now, crucially, these structures do not conduct electricity when solid, and that's because the ions are held tightly in fixed positions. However, they do conduct electricity when molten or dissolved in liquid, and that's because the ions are free to move and they're free to carry that charge. Now, ionic substances are brittle. That means that if you apply a force, they break apart easily. And that's because if you apply a force, you cause the ions to shift. And what happens is the ions with the same charge end up next to each other. And then automatically they repel, so the whole structure breaks apart. I'm really sorry this is really wooden. It's just there's so many details. And I'm really conscious of including them all. So I'm like, <gasps> but I'm going to do my best with it. Also, with ionic compounds, remember that they're soluble in water and insoluble in organic solvents. Remember that an organic solvent is something like alcohol, so ethanol, methanol, propanol. So that's everything I wanted to say about giant ionic compounds. 
Now moving on to giant covalent structures. And the real example we use for this is carbon in its two forms. So first of all, we're going to talk about diamond. So carbon has four unpaired electrons, which means it can form four covalent bonds. This is a large number of covalent bonds per atom. And in diamond, what you find is they form a tetrahedral structure, which is kind of a giant structure involving four bonds many times over. So you end up with this massive structure that has super, super strong covalent bonds pretty much everywhere. And you will find, therefore, that diamond has a ridiculously high melting and boiling point, and it's also exceptionally hard, which is why one of its uses will be that it is used as the drill tip in order to bore holes and break through rock and things, because you won't find anything else that's harder than diamond. So if the question goes, explain why diamond's so hard, just say it's because it forms four very, very strong covalent bonds in a tetrahedral structure, and these require a lot of energy to break. Diamond does not conduct electricity, and that's because there are no free electrons. It also does not dissolve in water or organic solvents for the same reason, because the carbon atoms are held tightly in fixed positions. The next giant covalent structure I want to talk about is diamond's close relative, but we're talking about graphite, which is a completely different structure, which I find, this is why I like chemistry so much, because having two things which are both made out of carbon be so different. You've got diamond that's incredibly expensive, valuable, precious, beautiful, which, and then you have graphite, which is just this black substance which isn't particularly appealing, and you use it in the leads of pencils and things. And why can you use it in the lead of pencils? Well, that's because it's a lubricant, and it means it's slippery, and that's because, unlike diamond, which is in a giant tetrahedral structure, graphite's arranged in layers, and what you find is there are weak forces between those layers, and those forces are really easy to break. So what happens is these layers slide off of each other, and therefore they transfer themselves onto paper, for example, so you can see that when you write with a pencil. Graphite, like diamond, has a very high melting and boiling point. It's very strong for the same reason, because there are very many strong covalent bonds. And again, like diamond, you'll find that graphite does not dissolve in water. So now we can move on to our last type of structure, which is the simple molecules. These are things like water and methane. And remember what I told you before, molecules are made up of a fixed number of atoms, whether that's two or thousand, it doesn't vary, unlike giant structures. What you find is there are obviously covalent bonds between the atoms, but between the molecules, so between one water molecule and the next, you'll just find weak intermolecular forces. And these are just the forces between molecules. And these require very little energy to break, which explains why they have very low melting and boiling points and they're pretty weak substances. So what you would say is something like water has a low melting and boiling point because of weak intermolecular forces between molecules which do not require a lot of energy to break. Unlike ionic substances, you will find that simple molecules aren't soluble in water, but that they are soluble in organic solvents. You also find that simple molecules don't conduct electricity, and that's because they have no overall charge. Right, I'm really sorry I was really wooden. I hope that was helpful. I think the main thing with this topic is to take each property in turn. Why does X have a high melting point? Why does X conduct when molten? Why does X not conduct when solid? So all of these properties, and just make sure you have a perfect answer. I've tried to give you those, so maybe it's worth watching this video and writing them down. And obviously there are loads of textbooks and things that can help you. As always, um, like it if you enjoyed my video. Leave me a comment down below and I'll see you guys next time.